You know why? Because bad things happen in Philadelphia. Bad things. <laughs> Center field, Victorino going way back, and he won't be. It's off his glove. It's off the Leonard, defended by Simmons. Is this the tagger? Oh, oh dream team. <laughs> bad things happen in Philadelphia as anybody who watches football can see that is true and we are here to talk about everything that is going wrong and maybe if there's anything going right but so we haven't been here since before the Cowboys game so we've got a lot to talk about Charles just give me like your main thoughts um, reactions to what's been going on Oh, it's been bad. It's been real bad. Like it, it's just pure unadulterated pain every Sunday for three hours, and it's not fun. And I'm. It's really hard to be a Carson Wentz supporter right now because I'm really starting to get off that train because it is really hard to support that guy anymore. We're giving him all this money. He can't do a simple check down pass anymore. He can't even say he doesn't have help because I understand that most of the team is injured right now, but. Even in the first week against the against the Washington football team, he did not perform well. He had all he had most of his weapons in that game. He didn't have Deshaun Jackson, I believe. But Deshaun Jackson, like, what is Deshaun Jackson gonna do? You know, like it's just so it's so frustrating with the Eagles right now. It is so unbelievably frustrating. And I'm really starting to think that it's time to just blow the whole thing up and start over again. With yeah, or without I think, Carson. Yeah, I think my biggest issue with the Eagles right now is just their refusal to change anything. You know, we see, you know, Jason Peters getting bull rushed every play uh, in the game on Sunday against Cleveland, and it, and they just continue to put him out there. When we have a 23-year-old left tackle in Jordan Mailata who played well in, when Peters was out, and he continues to not prove that he's not worthy of staying in the starting lineup, and he pretty much forced the Eagles' hand by giving him more money to move over back to left tackle. So it, it, it's – and, you know, you move on to with – Doug Peterson, he just refuses to change his play calling style. He's not creative in terms of the offense. And my biggest thing is Miles Sanders is second in the league in yards per carry right now with 5.7 yards per carry. He is second in the league, and he gets 15 touches a game. Why? They, Carson Wentz is having the worst year probably he's ever played in his life in football at any level. He leads the league in turnovers. You have a 27th ranked passing offense. Your offensive line is buns. They can't block anything. And, and, and Peterson still chooses to throw the ball 40 times a game. It, it's male practice at this point. Like, because you're, you're no, like, there's no wonder that the offense is struggling so much. You're putting the ball in the hands of Carson Wentz in the 27th ranked passing offense when you have a top, top 10 rushing offense and you just refuse to run the ball. I don't get it. Miles Sanders had two carries last week in the second half. I don't get it. I also don't understand the whole running back by committee idea. Like they just picked up Jordan, my, uh, Jordan Howard again. He got waved by the Dolphins. Like I just don't understand. Just give the ball to Miles. Run the ball. Yeah. It works. I think they I just still, I don't understand. When it comes to the committee, they I think they still go back to 2017 when we had a sack team, and it was like exactly. uh, everything was by committee. But now, I what Matt said about Miles Sanders is just one of the number one issues. You put your best player you put the ball in the hand of your best player and Miles Sanders is the best player and they so underutilize him. It's sickening with everything that's wrong. And he's one of the few things going right when, and especially with the quarterback, it's just bad. Very bad. Yeah. I mean, his, the, the first, the first drive of this Browns game, I mean, they were able to run the ball at will against them. I mean, obviously Miles Sanders fumble is a huge momentum shifter, but I mean, look, if you had that much success running against them, keep running it. I mean, unless he, you know, turns it over a couple more times, keep running it, especially in the rain and with Carson Wentz playing absolutely terrible. But I want to go back to, to Jason Peters. He is just awful right now. I mean, he, he cannot – I don't think he could stop me. I'm going to be completely honest. He just – he has zero quickness there. I mean, he, he's getting beat right away. Um 
I don't know what they could do to stop that. In fact, I, I thought I saw a report that he would want more money to sit. I mean, he's just being completely ridiculous. And quite honestly, I mean, he's not playing himself out of the Hall of Fame, but it feels like it. I mean, he is just brutal right now. I mean, look, Carson Wentz obviously doesn't have the confidence right now. And you can see that in a lot of times. He's, he's kind of double clutching the ball and staring down receivers. He's taking way too much time. But part of that is because he's ending up on his back after every play. I mean, I wouldn't feel com- I wouldn't feel confident, you know, being back there, receivers that can't get open and a line that gives you, you know, possibly a nanosecond half of the time. It's, I mean, I'm sure he's frustrated too. And, you know, it, it's obviously not all the line. Part of it is him, but. It's just all bad on the offensive side of the ball. You, know, you could, absolutely make oh, – sorry, I apologize. Yeah, no, you're good, Charles. Uh, I, I, I absolutely agree with that. And, you know, Carson Wentz's biggest problem right now is confidence or lack thereof. You know, he, he's standing in the pocket for too long, holds on to the ball for too long. And, you know, we saw in a couple instances in the Cleveland game where he's had guys open. He just has to make the throw, and he won't do it. He'll look at the receiver and double clutch, like you said, Chris, and – think about it too much. That's the one thing you can't do as a quarterback is it got to be, you know, you got to think about it a little bit, but you can't overthink it. And that's what he's doing right now. He's extremely over, like he's extremely overthinking it and it, it's really affecting his play. And it's the reason he's taking all these sacks and the reason that um, he's throwing all these picks and turning the ball over so much. He's holds on. He just holds on to the ball too long. He's just not playing confident right now. I think a lot of that lack of confidence, because I completely agree there is, and because everyone's to blame it on Carson Wentz, but I, and I'm not saying he's not a problem or a big one, but one of the biggest problems I see goes back is the offensive line. Mm-hmm. You have no protection. And that just makes Carson who already kind of had these issues we've seen in the past with overthinking and stuff like that just makes it a hundred times worse because he doesn't have protection. And then he starts to think he doesn't have protection and play completely just loose and not thinking because he's like scared of getting hit and then he gets hit anyways so he's playing he's playing hero ball that's what he's doing and it's he's just as uh, matt said he's overthinking it and you can't overthink it uh, as much as he's doing it right now it's just not it's the entire team it's obviously carson has his fair share of the blame i am not i'm not denying that at all the entire team is just not playing with a fire this just goes back to the giants game i'm watching the giants game two three weeks ago and i just feel i felt in my gut this team just doesn't want this win and doesn't want to win at all it's playing with no with no drive no energy it is going out there for three hours on sunday and embarrassing themselves in front of uh the entire the entire country and they're going on they're going to go on to uh, primetime television this monday against one of the best teams in the league they're going to get absolutely baby shaked by these by the seahawks and they're going to get it's going to be embarrassing and i'm going to have to uh go out in public the next day and say yeah i'm a philadelphia sports fan go eagles yeah they're, they're good right I don't think we have to say either of those things. <laughs> no, I don't think I don't think I'm going to, but I, yeah. I, got, I got a little bit of a little bit of pride. I got to protect here. I have a question for the group. Oh, so yeah. at this point, you know, we see where the Eagles are and we see where the rest of the NFC East is. Obviously, every, I think every team has three wins uh, and it's Thanksgiving. It's the end of November. Um, so my question is, at this point, would it even be worth it for the Eagles to win the division? Like, would you rather them lose the division and then get a much higher draft pick? Because if you make the playoffs, you win the division, you're are, you're guaranteed to be in, I think, the, the 20th. The 19th yeah, pick, I and think. Then, yeah, the 18th or 19th pick or higher. And if you lose the division, you'll probably be closer to a top 10 pick, if not in the top 10. So I'm interested. I'm very torn on this, but I want to see what you guys think about that. This is a great question because I've mm-hmm. had this conversation – with my family multiple times. <laughs> um, I'll let the rest of the group go first. <laughs> you know, I, I think it almost depends how they go in. If they somehow magically were to, I don't know, get hot, win a couple games, and it looks like they click, then you know what? Sure, win the division. But that's not, I don't think that's going to happen. In fact, I'm like 99% sure that's not going to happen. So, no, I mean, if they're going to win a couple of these games in really ugly fashion, like they've done all year and somehow win the division at like seven, eight and one or whatever the record would be, then no, it's not worth it because it just kind of masks the problems. I mean, the front office has to address it. They can't hang a division winner banner up and say, oh, look, 
we made the playoffs again, you know, new normal, our culture is great. No. Um, I, I mean, I, that's the problem I think is that it would mask over a lot of the issues and Howie Roseman needs to address a lot of stuff this off season, or quite frankly, they need to address Howie Roseman this off season because he hasn't exactly set them up in the future. You know, I mean, Carson Wentz is going to be making, I believe the cap hit is like $34.5 million next year. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, they're strapped going forward and they need to make changes. Yeah, I think what makes me unsure of the decision is how bad the Eagles draft. So I'm yeah. like, is it even worth it to win that draft pick? But the problem, I, I 100% agree with Chris where he said, and that's what, how I felt too, is that – um. If they win the division, do they pretend like it's not as huge of a problem like that? And it's such a meaningless win if you end up keeping it, like you said, if maybe they get hot and like look good and win the division. But right now, one, I don't think I doubt that they will at this point because the rest of the NFC East seems to be like getting it together a little bit more and the Eagles don't. So I wouldn't be surprised if the Eagles don't win, but you there are so many problems to address and you can't pretend like, Oh, we've made the playoffs every year since the Super Bowl, Like we're fine. Cause it's, it's not fine. And I want a draft pick, but I don't want them to waste it. <laughs> we also, we also have a sh- uh, tough uh, stretch of games coming up. We got to play the Seahawks. We have to play the Cardinals. Um, you know, the other two teams are eluding me right now. New Orleans, um, Green Bay. New Orleans. Yeah. Yep. It's yep. Everybody at the top, honestly. Yeah. I absolutely do not want them to win this division. I am pulling for the, uh, Washington football team on Thanksgiving day, go chase young, go Alex Smith, go Ron Rivera. It's <sighs> that team I think is right now is probably the best team in the league or in, not in the league in the division. Um, they definitely have the pieces to really be good in the future. And they'll probably get their quarterback this year in the draft, whoever that is, whether, you know, if they somehow get chase, not chase young, uh, Justin Fields, or um, maybe Trey Lance from North Dakota state maybe the kid from uh, BYU, they definitely have a need at quarterback because Alex Smith just shouldn't be in the league anymore. As much as I hate to say it, he just should, he should retire because he just, it's not worth the risk after that injury. Yeah. So I I definitely think they're the best team in the division and I hope they win it because I think they're the best chance to make the NFC East not look as big as a joke in the playoffs. The Eagles, the Eagles just, they need to get they need to get their their stuff together. It's it's really bad, and I really hope that they do somewhat or somewhat quickly because the rest of the NFC East is getting better. Like the Cowboys are having an off year this year, they'll be back next year. I don't know what's wrong with them because they have good players, they really do. But the rest of the division is getting better, better, and the Eagles just seem to be getting worse and worse. And I feel like a division win this year would just would um uh, set us back a little bit. I do think yeah. we could we could use the pick. Yeah, I agree, Charles. I agree with what most of you guys said. It's, you know, it's male practice at this point to think that there are no issues and to think that, you know, oh, we just got to keep attacking the week every week and you guys will see you guys. And they say the same crap every week and it's just not coming true. And, you know, I think winning the division would definitely mask some of the problems because as you guys said, they would just be like, oh, see, we won the division. See, fourth, fourth year in a row in the playoffs. There's no problems. There's not there's nothing wrong at all. But I think if they miss the playoffs, and especially with these stretch of games, I don't see them winning, quite honestly, any of these games until they get the division games at the end of the year when they won't even matter anymore. Um, and I, I think, you know, they'll lose all those games. And I think it's going to really slap them in the back of the head and be like, yo, we need a change. And I don't know what the change is going to be. I don't know whether it's going to be Peterson being fired. I don't know whether it's going to be Howie Roseman being fired. And I don't know whether it means something going on with Carson Wentz, maybe shipping him off or benching him. Um I don't know what it is, but something's going to have to change. And uh, I'm really eager to see what that change is because something has to change. Well, I have a question for the group. Do you think Doug Peterson is on the hot seat after this season? Yes. Yeah. His seat is hotter than a fox in a forest fire right now. It's hotter than fish grease, bro. There's, <laughs> his seat could not be any hotter right now. See, I've been talking to some other Eagles fans, and some, they still pull out, oh, he won us a Super Bowl. I'm like, oh, I just say like, okay, that was three years ago. You know, I feel like, like those people don't really know football. <laughs> yeah. And also look at all we lost from that Super Bowl team. We lost Frank Reich. We lost uh, John Filippo or whatever his name is. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, the whole team has pretty much changed since then. You know, Alshon Jeffrey uh, had a working ankle. 
uh, Jason Peters was still in his mid thirties, you know, and he not be even played in the Super Bowl, but mm -hmm. you know, Nick Foles, I mean, you could say what you want about the whole Nick Foles situation. I think it would be just, just as bad if we kept him over Wentz. it would be the same, same situation. Um, but I think the real issue is that we're looking back at that team, that 2017 team, we're saying, Oh, Doug brought us a Super Bowl, which he did, but he wasn't the main reason. You yeah, know, look, Frank Reich yeah. was the one calling the plays. That's Frank the Reich. question that's been coming up. We're like, do we know? And now are you starting to see if it wasn't Doug, if it yeah. was just everything else? And I don't think it was necessarily not Doug Pearson. It's just that, like, you can – the test of coaching is what you do when things aren't going right. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, Matt said it at the beginning, and it's the top thing, is nothing is changing – like, what are you doing in the week between games? Because it doesn't seem like you're fixing or changing a thing. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, you wonder, like, was it, Frank, was it Frank Reich? Like, you know, was he the guy? And I think probably it was because the play calling has disappeared since then. Yeah, I mean, they, they, they really miss Frank Reich. And to be honest, I, I think, you know, Doug likes to have his hand in, you know, the offensive play calling there. I think that's part of the problem is there's kind of too many cooks in the kitchen right now. Um, but to be honest, if, you know, I think Doug, Doug is going to be and has to be in my mind, the first one to go because Carson is making too much money and, you know, he's on the four year contract, 30 some million. And the problem is, you know, I, I think you, you have to give Carson another shot under another head coach. In my opinion, I think you give up on Doug first and, and Doug is just infuriating because even in some of his press conferences, he just always gives me like this. I'm smarter than you are kind of 100%. You know, yeah. 100%. Like, like uh, the, the question the other day with, uh, I forget, somebody asked him, you know, are you making a, a change at quarterback? And he goes, well, uh, not today. Uh, you know, then he just refused to answer the question. Like, dude, do you not know that this is the most important question on the team right now? Like, he almost act like he was surprised to, to get that question. Like, are you kidding me? Like, yeah. I don't know. He, he, he never seems prepared. He also doesn't seem like he likes to take as many well-calculated risks anymore, which is frustrating. It's not the same Doug yeah. that we have grown accustomed he to. He does these fake risks, like to act like he's still ballsy. Like, I'm going to go for two when I, there's no reason I should. And, and it's like, or like, that's just what makes me so mad. I'm like, you're just trying to pretend like you're yeah. exciting or different, but you're not. Or the yeah, Jalen yeah. Hurts roll out to the left. Like, oh, oh yeah. great. No we haven't, we haven't seen that every time he's in the game. Like, honestly, if you're a defense and he comes onto the field, you have to be laughing at this point because you you know the play. It's like mm -hmm. looking over when you're playing somebody at Madden and watching them select the play. Like, come on. It's not even fair at this point. And, and two, with – and off that point, in terms of Doug, you know, being ballsy for no reason, the going for two thing, is because it it's analytics, save me that. Um, I I think to the going for it on fourth down, and just constantly going being like fourth and fives around midfield, and just not getting the first down. And my problem with that is you wouldn't need to go for it on fourth down so much if you convert it on third down. They're two for twenty one on third downs in the past two weeks. 0 of 9 against the Giants two weeks ago. And that that to me is the biggest problem because Doug is like, look, I'm still the same coach. I'm still the same ballsy coach that's got us to the Super Bowl. But you're not because you're not you're not creative with the offense. You don't get your best players involved. You take the ball out of your hands, take the ball out of the hands of your best players and Miles Sanders. You don't get Jalen Rager involved. How's he supposed to progress? Travis Fulgham, he's saying, needs to get open in no uncertain terms. And how is he Fulgham supposed to do that if you don't get him in good routes and in good situations? Uh, Richard Rogers has looked like the best receiver we have out there, which is just a shame and not to take anything away from Rogers. He's playing well, but I think, you know, all of this is just a culmination of we are tired of Doug Peterson and he, he is quite frankly, seems tired of us as well. You know, pause because that was so good. <laughs> By the way, you mentioned Richard Rogers, um, Zach Ertz, tight end number three. I, I think I'm going to be completely <laughs> honest. Like, think about trading him. I mean, they absolutely. They I want don't Zach have the Ertz money. Gone so quick. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it, 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 I, it, well, I'm done. No, it, what, 
it wouldn't be that quick. He's very, very slow. It would no, be, right. even if we did trade him, it would probably take him a week to get wherever I'm he's so going. done with him. Get him off my <laughs> team. Jason Peters is okay. Well, Jason Peters is number one. Alshon Jeffrey with his like lack of feed or whatever his issue is. <laughs> I, I I want him gone and then Zach Ertz. Like, I'm sorry, I I've loved you, I respected you, but I'm done. Get out. Well, this is why I say blow up the team now while these players still have at least some value. Like you can still get something for Zach Ertz. You could probably you could get something for Carson Wentz. You could probably get something for Alshon Jeffrey just because he's a possession, he's a big possession receiver. You could definitely get something for at least, I don't know, maybe some defense maybe some defensive pieces. Like I'm not saying complete rebuild, but you have to get rid of these players before they lose their value. If you hold on to Zach to a Zach Ertz for another two years, no one's gonna want him anymore. Same with Carson Wentz. Carson's still like if we if we trade Carson to like the Colts for example we could probably get something out of it I'm not entirely sure what I don't know what the um uh, uh I believe it's Chris Ballard in Indianapolis um I don't know what he'd be willing to trade for someone like Carson Wentz because they did draft Jacob Beeson in the second round this past year but it's you, you have to blow up this team now it has to be now or never we mentioned like how uh, we are not the team from the Super Bowl, like we have don't have a lot of those players. And honestly, looking at our team now, the problem players or the ones that we should get rid of are the ones from the Super Bowl team. Mm -hmm. Like the ones that we see playing well that I'm actually like, you know, that was decent are these like younger rookie, like third string guys that come in and they show off. And I'm like, really like you just have to can't live in the past. You can't be stuck in 2017. And I don't want to be stuck in this rut any longer so and you see it all the time with championship teams like you said Kelly where they hold on to what worked in the past and what won them a championship in the past they hold on to it for too long that's exactly what's happening here you know we're giving Jason Peters too many opportunities we're letting Doug Peterson get away with things that he probably shouldn't be getting away with where you know Alshon Jeffrey is still on the team for whatever reason they would probably bring back LeGarrette Blunt if they could you know and and (laughs) you know it, it get it's getting to a point where you know, you cut Malcolm Jenkins because you didn't want to pay him. And I'm thinking, okay, well, this is the start of some of his trend where they're going to try and cut losses with um, – try and cut their losses with some of these Super Bowl contributors. And they didn't cut anybody else. It was just Jenkins. And Jenkins is probably the one you probably shouldn't have let go of. Yeah, um, I thought the I Jenkins mean, move was really good because I was with you. I – I was like, yeah, that was the right move and because I thought it would continue and you're it right. Would go like, in the right direction. If you were going to cut anybody, like, I mean, I was, I thought, I'll say, I did think it was a good idea to cut him. I, you know, I, he wasn't contributing as much as I like, I thought. And, but now he, he would have been better off than the people we're dealing with now. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the problem is like, like Charles was saying about getting rid of some of these guys is, it's it's like Groundhog Day with every single Philadelphia team in that we trade our guys, we get picks, and then we blow the draft picks. Because who do you trust in the front office right now to actually be able to execute the getting these draft picks? I mean, because Howie Roseman and the talent evaluators right now have not really shown me anything that would give them confidence going into a rebuild. I mean, quite honestly, I don't know if I want Howie Roseman being the one in charge of a rebuild, if that's the road that they're going to go down. Um, I I mean, Jalen Rager looks like a hit. J.J. Ortega-Whiteside, I'm not even sure he knows he's on the team anymore. Um, Yeah, I I mean, and then I guess Dallas Goddard was maybe the other good pick, so you're two for like your last, what, three drafts? (laughs) It's, I, you know, I just don't know what they're going to, do to be able to rebuild. I mean, they're, they're going to have to bring in some people from smarter organizations that know how to draft because that, that's the way you rebuild a team. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, and what I'm, and what I'm looking at too is, you know, in terms of front office, I don't know who they're going to go after, but they need to go after somebody, maybe a Daryl Morey type, but for football. Um, and, you know, in terms of coaching, if they let go of Peterson, which I think is it, they should at this point, if they aren't targeting the Chiefs offensive coordinator, Eric Bieniemy, they're not doing it right. They mm-hmm. have to go after him because he is in a fantastic situation, another uh, Andy Reid disciple. And I, I think, you know, if you bring him over, that our offense is going to start clicking again. Carson Wentz is going to start clicking again. And, you know, you see with the enemy, the, that offense is so creative every week. There's something 
that you haven't seen before in that offense every week. And, you know, maybe it's the Patrick Mahomes factor. Maybe it is. But I think also, you know, coaching with Andy Reid, you learn a lot. Mm -hmm. He's going to be a hot commodity this offseason. A lot of teams are going to be going after him. Yeah. Oh, for sure. But I think the Eagles just need to pony up and do everything they can to try and get him. Everything. Yeah. They're going to they're gonna have to. I mean, it, the offense has just looked so vanilla this year. And, I mean, Carson Wentz, the other thing is, I, you know, I'd like to see Carson Wentz get out of the pocket more. Like, he, he really hasn't. Like, look, I get the whole injury-prone thing, but can we just stop with that? Because yeah. the amount of hits he's taken this year, like, we can, we can throw the injury-prone thing out for now, okay? I mean, the amount of hits he's taken, if you were really injury-prone, he would have been hurt yesterday. I mean, yeah. so that's just not true. But get him out of the pocket. I mean, because he clearly is not a good pocket passer. He's best when he can roll out of the pocket and do things with his feet, and he hasn't been able to do that. And I blame that on our offensive coordinator. What offensive coordinator? We don't have an offensive coordinator. We didn't hire one. Doug Peterson was like, we don't need an offensive coordinator. I'm going to be the offensive coordinator and the head coach. He's like, why do we need more ideas when I can just keep doing the same thing for every week? And and this goes back to my frustrations and probably all of our frustrations with Doug Peterson's play calling is his just refusal to try anything new. And getting Carson Wentz out of the pocket, we've seen it for five years, how good he is at throwing on the run. We could even go back as far as the first thing I can think of uh, where we saw Wentz's ability to throw on the run was that uh, wheel route he threw to Darren Sproles on the sideline against Pittsburgh in 2016. It was like his third game of his career, and he's showing you how good he is at throwing on the run. And we even saw last week the two instances that he threw on the run. He threw dots to guys that weren't necessarily wide open, and he made great throws, and, and you just never saw it again. And I don't, I, for the life of me, I will not understand Doug Peterson's refusal to play to Carson Wentz's strength. I, I don't get it. Yeah, the other thing is, is I mean, they, they got to get somebody else open downfield besides, you know, Dallas Goddard or Richard Rodgers. And that's about it. Like, I, I mean, Travis Fulgham, I, it was almost like they forgot about him in the first half of the Browns game. I mean, I think he had exactly zero targets. Uh, Alshon Jeffrey, I, I would argue that he hasn't actually been on this team this year because he still has zero catches in the games or in the two games he's been back. So, I mean, that's the other problem is, is it seems like the, the route running on this team is just not good. I mean, be, either that or these guys have absolutely zero speed because I, I refuse to believe that Travis Fulgham all of a sudden can't get open anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, that I don't know. It, it seems – and even if he is in double coverage, then that means somebody else is open. You know, I don't know if that's on the play calling. I don't know if that's on Wentz not being able to see down the field well, but it is really frustrating. I have noticed sometimes it is Wentz because do you know how many times you watch and you're like, oh, that guy was wide open. <laughs> and he just takes yeah. forever and nobody thinks so he doesn't throw it. But... And sometimes it's like watching Sean Clifford out there on Sundays. I was, <laughs> oh I didn't want to. He has no vision. I'm not trying to change. Um, topic yeah, so with the Eagles yeah. here but it's kind of I just want to point out how sickening I it's sitting here and hearing how many problems that the Eagles have that the pet Penn State also has and how both of them are going to make me drink bleach or something because I can't take it anymore well going yeah. back to the whole drafting problem you see that the Eagles like in this past year they acknowledge the problem they had at their at receiver because they went out and they drafted three, four wide receivers just throughout throughout the rounds in the draft, but none of them have really hit except maybe Rager, and that's a huge maybe right now. So the, it's almost like the organization knows the issues that face them right now, and they just can't – they don't have the ability to, to solve these issues. And that's – there has to be changes made – changes have to be made, excuse me, in the, uh, in the front office. Yeah, I'm not yeah. ready to give up on Jalen Rager quite yet. I mean, he obviously hasn't got he, – he's missed a good chunk of the year with injuries as well. Um, shocking. And uh, I also think that he just hasn't been put in opportunities to show what he's got. You know, we saw week one Washington, they sent him deep. He caught a 50-yard pass. and Everybody was like, oh, my God, it's finally happening. We have a deep threat. And then since then, it hasn't happened, and I don't know why. Um, nobody knows why. 
Uh, Jalen Rager is just not it, – they're not putting him in situations where he can make a great play. They're not putting him in space. They're putting him on – wide receiver screens on the sideline where they just throw it to him across the line of scrimmage and he has to try to make something happen in front of like three dudes and it's not working shocking and you know they should be looking at ways to get him involved where he can make plays in space much like the rams do we saw it on monday night the way they do it with cooper cup and robert woods they're constantly putting those guys in situations where they are in space and can make a play and and the eagles just don't do that with any of their guys yeah absolutely You're 100% right on that. Um, going back to this year's draft, though, I, I actually – I think Rager will be okay. I mean, I, that was a pick that I overreacted to at the time. Um, <laughs> my big problem is still the uh, the Hurts pick because it almost felt like they were just like, you know what, we feel good at every other position right now, which is just, my God, they couldn't be more arrogant. Um, well, let's just use a pick on a quarterback that will play for – you know, maybe two snaps a game. That was ridiculous. I couldn't I hate, agree more. I when they did, that I, mean, I was, of course, um, enraged. And then also, I completely agree that that's what I saw too. Was they acted like they didn't need anything else when you need everything. Yeah. Which now I think you I might know. need a quarterback it's... too. But um, Jalen, I don't think. I think we've all talked aside from this podcast just on the Jalen Hurts issue that other people around us have said that aren't Eagles fans are just like, why isn't Jalen Hurts in? And I think we all agreed that he must not show anything in practice that makes him seem worth putting him in over once. So uh, anyone want to elaborate on that? Yeah. I've never been a Jalen Hurts fan, so it doesn't surprise me at all that he hasn't been put in. Like, I didn't think he was coming. I don't. Th- I didn't. I understand he won a lot in college, but I didn't think he was going to going to be a good NFL quarterback coming out. Um, and I, my biggest problem with the Jalen Hurts pick this past year was we got rid of Foles. We finally had a year without Foles, where everyone was, everyone was uh, saying, you know, put Foles in after Wentz had a bad game. Foles would, Foles will win us another Super Bowl. And I was really getting annoyed with that because I just thought Nick, I, as much as I love Nick Foles. He just got hot at the right time, and that's what that's what uh, eventually got us that that championship. But couldn't agree more. We yeah, but we we finally got rid of him, and I was like, yes, finally we can finally focus on our franchise quarterback that we franchise quarterback that we just paid, and then we draft another quarterback in the second round that everyone knows because he played at Alabama and at, at Oklahoma. So we basically put ourselves in the same exact situation that we just got ourselves out of, and. Once again, I wasn't a fan of him coming out of college. So I was not a fan of that pick at all. And I knew exactly what Doug wanted to do with him. He wanted to wanted use him to- as a Taysom Hill type. And I was like, why are we spending a second round pick on a Taysom Hill that doesn't even play? Like, And just- it, it really goes back to, because I thought the same thing. We just got away from the two quarterback issue. Mm-hmm. And now we are here again. And it's not, honestly, it's neither of them I even want on the field. So it's yeah. a and lose-lose. You- lose. People are saying put Jalen Hurts in now, but like we, like we already said, we have this really tough four game stretch coming up. So it's not like he's going to be doing any better. It? Yeah, yeah, he's not like he's going to be doing any better with this awful team than Carson Wentz says. A, a rookie going up against Aaron Rodgers, like come on, don't do that. Against yeah, going and, up and, against Russell Wilson. Yeah, and you know, in terms of the quarterback situation, you brought it up a little bit, Charles. In terms of what would putting Jalen Hurts in right now, what would that even fix? Because Carson Wentz, while he is a problem right now, is not the main problem. And if you think he is the main problem, then you're just watching the games and you're not analyzing them. Because mm-hmm. you look at film from after the game, you look and you take a little bit to calm down. Because Sundays, you know, <laughs> watching the game, you're like, oh, Carson Wentz, what the heck are you doing? But you really start to think about it. And Carson Wentz is a problem. Leading the league in, in the turnovers is a problem. But he's not the main problem. And putting Hurts in – what would that fix? It wouldn't fix anything because you're still not going to run the ball. You're still not going to get guys open and create space. You're still not going to be creative with the play. Well, maybe he'll call a couple of read options. Who knows? But um, it's not going to fix anything. And especially putting a rookie out there behind that offensive line, he's going to get murdered. Like he's going to, you know, same thing we Ex- went, he's going to get hit a lot and it's going to be an issue. Exactly. And people are saying, let's just put him out there and see what we have, but we're not going to see what he has or what, what we have in Jalen hurts. If he's playing against or playing with this absolutely awful team. Yeah. Yeah. And we've seen two, like one awful team and the awful play calling. So you're just going to put 
this rookie in that needs you to like give him the plays to get things done and you ha- you can't do it. like because when you're I mean Carson Wentz has a problem with it too like can't make like his own decisions it seems like or like at le- least makes the wrong one but then so think of how bad we look now and then you're going to put this guy in that has no experience at all and think he's going to get things done like anybody who thinks that's going to fix it is and especially with this streak coming up is is an idiot you're just going to shoot his confidence. He's not going to have, it's going to stunt his entire, his, all of his growth for the rest of his NFL career. I never liked Dwayne Haskins. I never thought he would pan out anyways, but I will give him like, that's what the, um, at the time the Redskins did to him. Like he was just thrown in and be like, try to fix us. And it's like, you can't. Yeah. This, this actually transitions well to what I want to talk about next. And that's the Seattle game because Seattle's defense is horrible. Carson Wentz has to light them up, period, or else I think he could get benched for one game. I, I think if there's going to be, you know, a sort of a let's see what Jalen Hurts has is if he doesn't light up Seattle and they just say, look, we need to give him a game to hit the reset button. Let's see what Jalen has. If he doesn't absolutely light it up, Carson's back the next week. That's the only way I think that this happens. But Seattle's defense is horrible. I mean, I heard the stat the other day that they're uh, on pace to give up a thousand yards more than than the record for the season, um, which is just amazing. I mean, they're god awful. Their secondary. Carson Wentz has to show something this week. This is kind of, for me, this is kind of the make or break week this season um, because if he's going to show that he does in fact have, you know, a little bit of his old self left in him there, even with as horrible as the supporting cast is and the offensive play calling, they can overcome that this week because just how bad Seattle's defense is. Um, So we'll see. I mean, I I would like to see more out of him this week though. Mm -hmm. I absolutely agree with that. I think Carson's going to have not a good game, but a better game this week, just because of how poor the uh, Seahawks secondary is well here's the thing with that is that we've said that the last two weeks when playing the Giants and the Browns who both rank in the bottom half of the league in pass defense and we're like yeah. okay so he should in theory have a better week this week look better this week and it's it's the same disappointment you know at this point for us as fans we need to stop having expectations for this team and for this offense to do anything remotely competent because it's just not going to happen. It, exactly. And it's just not, it's just not going to happen. And to go into any game with reasonable optimism or expectations, is just foolish at this point, because they've I, given us, they've given us no reasons to be optimistic. You're even completely if this right. is, even if this, I don't care. This is the worst defense ever. I don't, this could be the 2008 0 and 16 lines. I don't care. The Eagles probably wouldn't put up a good offensive output. And they will probably finish the season 0-16 and in enjoyable games to watch. I had a friend who was like, oh, the Eagles playing the Giants. Like, that should be a win. And I was like, nothing should be a win anymore. Like, I was like, they, I, literally, I said to her, like, I was like, I have no faith in this team. And, and that's not because I'm, like, giving up on the team or anything. It's just really there has been no viable reasoning to put faith in this team. And it's funny because people look, someone was like, and it's funny, this was my words. I used to say it all the time. I said, Eagles win games they're not supposed to. That's what they do. But now they can't win games at all. Like, that's literally impossible. So people are like, they feel like they'd pull it out against the Seahawks just because that's like classic Eagles. And I was like, it's literally, I was like, I would bet my beating heart, like, you can take it out of my chest if they beat the Seahawks because we didn't beat the Seahawks in 2017. We don't, we never beat the Seahawks. Yeah. And yeah, I Carson like, never plays, this? performs well against the Seahawks. I don't care if the it's Seahawks true. decided to put all their four-string players in. I just, I don't, it's not happening. I do think that, I, I agree with Chris's point that we should give Carson Wentz a week to reset, but I don't think that the Seahawks game is the week to do it. Mm-hmm. I do think that if, you know, the Eagles do fall out of contention for the NFC East, which I think they will, I think last week of the season, I believe they're playing, uh, I think they're playing the Cowboys last game of the season this year. I'm not entirely sure, um, but I think that's the game you put in Jalen just to see what you got, I guess. And it pains me to say that because I'm not a fan of Jalen Hurts at all. But 
It's just, yeah, it's Kelly, just really going, hard right now. Kelly, what? going back to your point about um, the Eagles never being able to beat the Seahawks, I looked this up the other day. The Eagles and Seahawks have played nine times since 2005. They have won one of those games, and it was in 2008. And they have played God. one, two, three, four, five, six games. That doesn't since- shock me at all. Six games since that since that last time we beat Seattle in 2008, they have lost each and every one of them, including three times in the last four three and three times in the last three years. We lost them twice last year, both times at home. So, in terms of teams really having our number, Seattle is up there. Uh, we have not been able to stop Russell Wilson since he came into the league, um, and the Eagles have just notoriously been awful against certain teams in Seattle is one of them for whatever reason. And it's, you know, teams like Arizona as well, for whatever reason, we cannot play against Arizona. So I don't, I I said, I have no expectations. This is the epitome of that. I have literally no expectations for this game on Monday night. Yeah. I'm with you because like you said, you could lose the rest of the season, like every game the rest of the season, but I was like, I 100%, there's no way this year. And I don't think we're, I wonder if we'll even look de- decent. But, yeah, uh, just on the other note, we end the season um, versus Washington. Yeah. Okay, Co- that's what I – Cowboys the week before that. I knew it was Was the Washington or Cowboys, but I wasn't sure. So, now I'm going to have to back check. All right, if you guys want to kind of switch gears here, um, we could talk about the Sixers for a little bit because they're the only team bringing me somewhat joy right now. Um, <laughs> Daryl Morey has come in and really, really – saved us from cap hell um al horford is gone shed most of his contract most likely we got a shooter back in danny green who i realize isn't you know danny green isn't the best uh he didn't have the best season last year but he can shoot the three and he can play perimeter defense which is what we need um we got seth curry for josh richardson like i like josh richardson as a player but he did not fit in our offense he did not fit playing with simmons and Embiid. Um, and Seth Curry is going to, I think, kind of take over that J.J. Redick role where he's going to play really well off of Simmons because he's going to be able to catch and shoot when Simmons is driving him whole and he kicks it up at, kicks, can kick it back out to a three-point shooter who is the second best historically three-point shooter in NBA history in terms of uh, percentage. So I think that is obviously huge. Um, and then even the Dwight Howard signing as a backup center. Look, we know Embiid's going to miss games. We know it's going to happen. Okay. We know he's going to get hurt at some point. Having a proven backup center in a guy like Dwight Howard, who was a first team all NBA guy for most of his career in Orlando, he knows how to play the center position and he's not going to do too much. He's not going to, he's not going to put you in a bad situation. Uh, I think that was an underrated great signing to steal him away from LA as well. I think, you know, I love what Daryl Morey has done with this team and he's really saved us from <laughs> looking at years of pain and misery. Yeah. D- Daryl Morey has given this team a direction again, because I'm going to be honest, it felt like the process had stalled and it was just kind of over after Jimmy Butler left. And then obviously the Al Horford signing was just absolutely horrible. The Al Horford signing, it, it felt like Elton Brand realized that, they needed a big splashy signing um, a- after Butler left and just kind of threw money at the first guy he could get. I mean, because he, he clearly didn't fit this team, Al Horford. I mean, I- I'm not really sure still what the thinking was behind that. But no, Daryl Morey has really come in and saved this team. And none of these were huge moves, but, but getting that money off the books, because I mean, it was a massive contract to Al Horford is nothing short of a miracle. I mean, I thought that they would have to even give up more. Danny green is a good return. I mean, obviously he didn't have the best year last year. If he could somehow get back to what he was, you know, when the, when the Raptors won the championship, I mean, he was great that year. Um, But yeah, I mean, if he could get back to that, that'd be awesome. But they needed a three-point shooter or a couple of them, and they needed a J.J. Redick type, and that's kind of what they got in Seth Curry. Um, But no, I mean, Elton Brand building this team, I mean, he basically, Daryl Morey undid everything he did in a year. I mean, that's basically what his job was, and he did a good job going over the GM's head of doing that. Um, And looking around the league, 
there's a couple teams like I think the Celtics have gotten slightly worse. Um, so I mean, the Sixers definitely I think are still in contention in the East now with these moves. Darren Morey has single-handedly restored my faith in the Sixers organization. It has been yes. a really rough past couple of years, especially this past season, getting swept by the Celtics in the playoffs. It has been really – we call it bad things happen in Philadelphia for a reason. And this past six-year season is definitely one of the reasons why, being in the bubble and then getting swept in the playoffs. I, I'm just happy we got rid of uh, that, Al, that awful Al Horford contract. I never liked the signing to begin with. For some reason, they just wanted to get big. And I in a, in a era of the NBA, where shooting is everything. They just wanted to be big down low with – people like uh, Joel Embiid and Al Horford. I'm just really glad we dumped that contract off. I think and you all said all it. I, oh, go ahead. That's all I can say. That's all I can say. I think you all said it best. I, I really was done with the Sixers. I mean, I was just like, cause you know, we are supposed to, you know, we're still in contention. We're supposed to, the process is still, I was done. I was like, I don't believe in this team anymore. And I know that's a lot to say when you still make it to the playoffs, but I was really so finished. And then, he came in and the minute he got rid of Al, Hor- Al Horford, I was like, all right, like we're good. And then it just kept going after that. Is any, I'm just glad it, it was finally moves that felt like actual moves that might push you in a direction. Unlike like the other in the past where it just felt like, like I remember last year with the draft and trade, it, it was just like, are we, are they, if Sixers doing anything I was waiting to hear like what they would do and I it was like nothing and we just lost Jimmy Butler which I will never maybe never get over because I'm still not over it because <laughs> I just I won't get into it <laughs> I'm with you on that Kelly I hated that they got rid of Joe, uh, Jimmy Butler because when you look at that season I'm not, I'm not gonna rant but when we look at that season I was like he looks like the only one that the key is the guy like he's the one that's winning the game and they chose they chose it was between brett brown and jimmy butler so they, looking back on it now they chose one year of brett brown over a four-year contract of jimmy butler which at this point seeing how he just dragged the miami heat to the nba finals looks yeah. insane in pain yeah. without the s in pain yeah, that's what, it was really <laughs> watching the watching the finals this year and watching jimmy butler really shine it was yeah it just that was part of the reason i really was losing faith in the Sixers just because you know you have this guy completely putting everything he has out on the court and he's not on our team anymore and he could have been it's just yeah I'm totally with Kelly on this one I hated that I loved having Jimmy Butler I loved the signing when we got him I loved him yeah and and with Daryl Morey too you know we going back to that it's it's the first time we've seen competence in a Philadelphia organization in terms of a front office since probably like 2017 with the Eagles before the season even started that mm-hmm. off season before the 2017 season where they were putting pieces in to surround Wentz. And, you know, now we're looking at that with the Sixers this is the first time since probably Sam Hinkie was still here. They've had, cause the Colangelo's were a colossal disaster, like worse than you could even probably fathom the Twitter burner situation. Wow. Um, and then of course, Elton Brand who doesn't, know what he's doing at all clearly um just signing guys who have big names and being like yes he will help the team and I think I'm still convinced the only reason we signed Al Horford was because we didn't want Embiid to go against him that was the only reason and and if that's the main reason that you're dishing out 27 million dollars a year to Al Horford then you should probably rethink your position as a general manager for a basketball team. Yes. Enjoy that competence until the Phillies start getting going. And yeah. You know, and that's, and, no, let's talk about the Phillies then. So here we go. The <laughs> Phillies. JT Real Muto, if he's not in the Phillies uniform this season, fire Matt Clentock and John Middleton into the sun because that you traded away your best prospect in probably years in Sixto Sanchez for two years of JT Remuto, please. And not Bryce Harper. Him. Yeah. It's a not keep him. And Bryce Harper is so vocal about wanting to keep JT around. And JT wants to be in Philadelphia. He's expressed multiple times to the media that he wants to be in Philadelphia. Bryce Harper, the guy you just just out $330 million to is screaming at the top of his lines to shine JT Remuto, And they just won't do it. He should have been signed to a contract extension before the year even started. The fact that we're get, heading into free agency now with him still not on the team is, again, male practice. If they don't sign JT Rio Muto, if he's not in Philly's uniform, I won't be in Philly's gear. I, 
if you watch that season last season, which was not enjoyable, the only person that was ever doing anything right, I mean, I mean not the whole season, but most of the time, was JT Rio Muto. He is the guy. And when you said, you said it best, Bryce Harper, Mr. Million Dollar Man, like our future, if he's saying JT Rio Muto, you pay JT Rio Muto. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this, you talk about a front office that's a mess. They're absolutely incompetent. I mean, thank God. I, I don't really know what Matt Klintak's new position is since he got reassigned, which, I mean, he could be working the hot dog vendor station for all <laughs> I know. But I, I mean, which, which is probably what he deserves to be doing after the job he's done the last couple of years. But then, then they go and say, you know what? Nobody wants to uproot in the middle of a pandemic to become a GM. And then the Marlins go out there and sign the first female GM, who, by the way, is beyond, you know, perfect for that job. I mean, her resume is amazing. And, and then the Angels sign a GM. Everybody's making fun of the Phillies. I mean, you look at Buster Olney had a, I think it was Buster Olney had a piece on ESPN talking about how other, you know, executives from front offices are saying they have no idea what the Phillies are doing. I mean, the, the Phillies need to wake up. And, and kind of like Daryl Morey was the perfect fit for the Sixers, Theo Epstein uh, is possibly, well, he is leaving Chicago. I think you have to throw the kitchen sink at him to, Mm -hmm. to join the Phillies. Um, if you I mean, don't, he, you'll join the Mets. Yeah, exactly. Yep. And he broke the two longest uh, World Series droughts in baseball history with the Red Sox and Cubs. So they need somebody like him to have a vision for this team because God knows Andy McPhail is a bum. I mean, I, I don't actually know what he does besides sit. For some reason, he doesn't even live in Philly. He lives down in Maryland and runs the team, even though – he clearly doesn't care. I mean, he's the same guy that said, if we don't, we don't on making the playoffs. And then, you know, of course you got John Middleton, who by the way is worth billions of dollars crying poor that they can't sign JT. Like, dude, you're worth billions of dollars. Do you know how much money you would make if JT comes back and this team actually makes the playoffs, you would make up for your losses. I, it is so frustrating to watch this team. Is there a more appropriate name in sports than Andy McPhail? No, I thought no. I thought his name was fake. I thought somebody was like putting like like making his name a joke, but that's actually his name. And, and he was going to really, be on any team, of course. It's of course it's the Phillies, and you know, in turn, you can't underestimate JT Remuto's value. Like I wouldn't say give him three hundred thirty million dollars. No, no catcher's worth that. But defensively, offensively, he is the best catcher in baseball. And he's shown mm -hmm. it time and time again that he, and he's even showed it this year in the shortened season that he was will he could carry that offense mm -hmm. when nobody else was hitting. And for a catcher to be able to do that, he can hit with power, hit for contact. He has great speed for a catcher. He's probably the best defensive catcher that we've had here since Chooch. And he's the best defensive catcher in baseball. Uh, he throws guys out stealing, which is a huge part of the game, um, throws them out with ease. And if the if the Phillies are not able to re-sign him and he ends up playing for the Mets, I might just combust in the flames. That's my, that's my thing. Not only would you be losing may, you're one of your best players, definitely top three, you, they go to the Mets. The Mets are making all the moves that the Phillies should be making. Not the same exact ones, but they're like the bad team actually working to progress like the Phillies should be. And if he is in a Mets uniform, I, I will, I'm with you. We can combust into flames together. <laughs> I would be so done. And you can hear me on this podcast again. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and honestly, I would be interested to see if you ran this team back, but with a, even a league average bullpen, I mean, the offense when Alec Bohm, who by the way, is the first legitimate stud that the Phillies have, Brought up, I mean, I guess Aaron Nola on the pitching side, but the first legitimate offensive stud that they've brought up since probably that wave of talent that won the 08 series. Um, I, I mean, they have a decent lineup. I mean, when everybody is clicking and Alec Bohm, who is an RBI machine, is in the lineup, they're really good. They needed, if they had a bullpen this year, they would have, I think they could have even won that division. But, you, you know, you take JT out of the lineup and that removes a huge, you know, mm -hmm. piece there. 
And I don't even know who you replace him with looking at the free agent market. That's, that's another issue is that there's not really anybody out there. And I've heard the Andrew, Phillies want to pull an Eagles and bring back somebody from the past with Cole. Right. Hansel. Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, look, Andrew Knapp had a great year. I, I'm definitely part of the Knapsack gang, but I mean, he's, he, he's, he's a backup. He Ooh. is a backup and he's a fine backup, <laughs> but he should not be starting over a guy like JT Romuto. And if there's somebody in that front office that actually thinks that he can, you know, replace the, the void from JT Romuto, then they're kidding themselves or being ridiculous. But at this point, the front office needs a major overhaul. Look, it's been nine years of tanking. Nine years. They have one of the five longest playoff droughts in the MLB, okay? And they don't have anything to show for it. Their farm system is weakened. They've got a couple guys down there that I think are going to be pretty good in a couple of years. But they have nothing to show for this nine years of tanking besides a bloated payroll and a 500 record. So it, it is time to clean house. And it has, it has to start with the ownership because you can't fire the owner. That is, you've said it best. I think we could um, end it on that point. I don't think it gets better. But a good wrap-up question for the group. Chris said he has the perfect one. Chris, let us hear it. So in honor of Thanksgiving, and this is going to be a tough question given how the year has gone, what are you guys thankful for in Philly sports? I, I We've talked about him a lot already on this podcast, but I'm going to say Daryl Morey. You know, I, I know it's been maybe a month, two months with him being here, but even seeing the way that he's turned this franchise around already, uh, I think that's enough to be thankful for in its own, in its own right. And trading Al Horford and getting rid of his contract is enough to be thankful for in its own right. Uh, he just fell into our laps and, and Doc Rivers as well. I think he's going to be, um, I think he was the perfect hire for this team. I think he's going to get Simmons and Embiid to work together really well. Um, so, you know, I'm looking forward to 2021 and the future with, um, with Darren Mori and Doc Rivers at the helm. I'm thankful for Darius Slay. He's been playing really good football this year. He's one of the few bright spots on this Eagles team. We finally have a corner that can shut, not shut down, but at least keep up with, the top receivers around the NFL. And um, that's the only thing I'm thankful for this year, especially with the Eagles being as abysmal as they are. As they are. Um, I'm going to throw it back a little, I guess, not really. But um, I'm going to be thankful for the Flyers because they actually seem like they're on the up and up. And they gave me the joy when I needed it. They, yes, they didn't like go to get the Stanley Cup, but – with the way the other teams were, the Eagles, the Sixers getting swept, I needed that. And it was, and, co, you know, quarantine, it felt great to watch the Flyers and feel excited. And I hope that they're just great again next season. So I'm going to go with the Flyers and Gritty, of course. Um, you know, there's, there's a couple things. I think Matt Contact has been the bane of my existence and he's gone. <laughs> So that, that's exciting. Um, I was hoping by now JT would have a new contract or we would have signed Theo, but that didn't happen. So I'm going to go with the, I'm going to go with something Flyers themed. Their old GM, um, Hextall, has done a, or did a fantastic job setting up this team. I mean, everybody that you see on this team was really drafted under him for the most part. And not only do they have a young core and a finally a bona fide stud in goal. They also have one of the top 10 farm systems in the league. And I mean, they, they look stacked for the future and they have a new GM that knows what he's doing. They have a head coach that knows what he's doing. They, they look like a legitimate powerhouse going forward. As long as, you know, they don't have anything catastrophic happen, knock on wood. But I, I think that they're poised for a big couple seasons here and, God, I just want to see them bring home the cup for the first time in decades. So, but I'm definitely thankful for the run that they've been on. Oh, well, we will try to find joy. If JT Real Moto is signed, it will fix all my Eagles pain. I swear I will be a lot better off. But um, for now, until next time, which I'm sure there'll be a lot more. 
um, or at least just more to add to what we've already said, but a lot more complaining to do next time. This has been bad things happen in Philadelphia, and they definitely do for Charles, Matt, Chris. I'm Kelly. Thanks for watching. Thank you for watching this edition of Penn State Sports Night. If you're a fan of our content, please be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more clips. Also, follow us on Twitter at PSSN TV and on Instagram at PSU Sports Night to keep up with all the action. For all my colleagues, we are Penn State Sports Night.